Well, welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, we will give everyone a few minutes to join. I see the numbers ticking up. Be patient, grab some water, get a comfortable seat. We are prepared for a, a juicy conversation today with the one and only David Bornstein. Uh, look, the auditorium is filling. The virtual auditorium is filling, David. <laughs> My heart I, had is time, I had time to play Shaka Khan. That's all I'm saying. Tell me something good. <laughs> I had time. Here we are. Here we are. Well, it is wonderful to have everyone today. I just want to start by um, thanking Ashoka, even as we're waiting for all that you do in the world to make the world a better place. Um, for I will introduce myself. Um, my name is Morgan Dixon, and I'm one of the co-founders and many, many organizers across the world for an organization called Girl Trek, which Ashoka believed in very early um, and, and kind of put their uh, weight behind, and I just deeply appreciate. Um, I'm here with my guest today who also believed in Girl Trek very early, um, and it is a man named David Bornstein. Uh, if you do not know David Bornstein, shame, shame. You must not have been getting the tweets from Ashoka. David Bornstein is an all out star, uh, the head of solutions journalism. He is an award winning journalist um, and uh, worked for the New York Times for many, many years doing a column on uh, the fixes and that many of us read and uh, read religiously around what we can believe in in this time of deep, 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 deep pain. <laughs> um, and so, David, I'm grateful for you. I will always, I will also tell a funny story that I actually met David in a bar. Is not quite as salacious as you would imagine. I think it was at an Ashoka event, actually, was it? It was. It was in New Orleans. It was, it was in New Orleans. <laughs> you say New Orleans or New Orleans? Come I on, David. We say it the Canadian way. You are the David of the people. Come on. <laughs> It is very Canadian. Um, and we met there and um, I completely blew it with David and in his generous way, he's, he uh, continued to ask me questions <laughs> about my movement. And everyone was like, you probably wanna to talk to this guy. Uh, he's very smart and very powerful. So David, thank you for being a, re a reporter of the people. Thank you for all of the work you do with, with the Solutions Journalism Network. Uh, and shall we get into conversation? We have lots and lots of people in the room. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you, Morgan. It's so good to be with you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have 30 minutes, so I would like to jump right in with questions. When you say solutions journalism, what do you mean for the, for the lay people like me? What are you yeah. actually talking about? Really specifically, it's rigorous reporting that looks at how people are trying to respond to some social problem and basically what we can learn from it. So, and, and it's, a, it's not advocacy, it's not public relations, it's not puffery, it's not hero stories, it's not news that's meant to make you feel good about the world or give you a smile. It's really looking, it's interrogating responses, uh, really, you know, with a, with a clear-eyed view of what we can learn from them, where the evidence is, what the limitations are. We're really trying to build a body of knowledge through journalism about how to build a better world. Uh, you know, it's so funny, David. Well, first of all, full disclosure, um, I serve on the solutions journalism um, board or network board. And I still, the reason they asked me to do this interview, I am convinced is because I still have so many questions <laughs> and I'm that board member who still just, just has so many questions. So um, I've never heard it described quite so cogently. Um, and so I'm grateful for that definition of, of rigorous reporting. And it makes complete sense now why there's so much tension when I bring up social media um, to the Solutions Journalism Network, because it is by nature very difficult to be rigorous in 144 characters on Twitter um, and so forth. So I wonder like, how do you, or where do you place um, solutions journalism in the context of fast paced Inform distributed information giving. Yeah, so I mean, you know, we're we're living in a world today. I think of it as like the 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 world of journalism or the world of media is like a Ferrari that just keeps getting faster and faster, and it runs into this dirt track <laughs> called the human nervous system, which can only handle like ten miles an hour and is very very easily overwhelmed by too much information and also too much information that makes you feel fatalistic, that makes you feel hopeless or powerless or just kind of outrage fatigue if you're, you know, depending on what channel you're tuned into. So that's kind of the world, 8 billion people with a, with a, a you know, a collection device and a transmitting device in a many to many configuration about trying to make sense of the world. 
And so, you know, what, what I think is, is really important to understand is that there's different kinds of information. And I think that's the most important point. Like, like if you go to a doctor's office and you're there for 30 minutes and the doctor only spends the entire 30 minutes telling you how sick you are and never mentions treatment options, that's a bad appointment, right? And in some ways, that's the appointment we have when we meet a lot of media today, whether it's journalism or whether it's journalism that gets amplified through social media channels, we get a lot of diagnosis of what ails us, a lot of diagnosis that tells us what's urgent, what's outrageous, what's painful, what's threatening. We need to also have information that helps us understand where is the efficacy around that? What can we do about it? Um, what are our options, our menu of options? And how do we know that they're good options? So I think like in the world that you just described, which is like super, super fast captures of information, we really need to be mindful that we're still dealing with human beings, we're still dealing with the human heart, and we need to understand that people need a sense of control. They need to have a sense of what can we do about it, or they will disengage. They'll, they'll literally deny the message, blame the messenger. You know, we have so many people delaying global warming today for that very fact. So that's a very... Um, you know, human behavior is something we really need to take into account in this massive uh, media system that we've created. Yeah, that was great. I, you know, well, first of all, where are the places that you get your news from? Like, who are the who are the people you read every day? You know, I just I, I have a, a feed that you know, like I'll look through Twitter and I'll just see journalists really across the spectrum. But I have to say that. You know, because like we've now worked with 600 different news organizations directly across the world, you know, in the US and Canada in Western and Eastern Europe and Africa, predominantly less so in Latin America, because we're still primarily English speaking serving news organizations, and in South Asia. Um, so I'm really tracking the solutions journalism output that's coming from news partners that we've worked with and we have a database called the solution story tracker which has tracked journalism from 1600 news organizations. But, you know, I, I, I realized early in my life that I'm very susceptible to despair and hopelessness. Like I actually, it's something that I, so I've really found that it's important for me to key in to what are the opportunities? What are the stories that help us understand how we can do better against any particular problem, especially with, you know, the poly crisis today, whether, you know, with war and systemic racism and the climate crisis and democracy unraveling in different places and authoritarianism, we really need to be able to, to also get the signal of what are people try, doing, or at least trying to do, that, uh, that looks like it's something that can be built upon. So you say you support journalists all around the world. Can you talk to us about, um, well, first of all, welcome to the 30 other people who joined the conversation. My name's Morgan. I'm in conversation with David Bornstein. Thank you for joining us. We're talk talking about solutions and journalism. Um, and I welcome your questions. There are 60 brilliant people on this call and I welcome your questions. We will spend half of today's 30 minutes answering your questions directly. So please put them in the comments. Um, please, please, please. And David, you say you you say that you're supporting people around the world, which congratulations on that expansion. Um, I think in a globalizing world, this is very, very important for um, the network. Um, yeah. What does that, if I am a journalist, I happen to be in Ghana right now. I am a mm -hmm. journalist in Ghana. What can I expect um, in terms of support or network or what does that look like for you to support journalists? Yeah, so initially, like for the last nine years since we started, we've been doing direct workshops in newsrooms and we have staff, you know, in different parts of the world where you can literally call up, you know, SJN and ask for a workshop um, about how to do solutions journalism. And we sort of realized that there was, we got to a point where there was so much more demand for learning about solutions journalism than we could, than we could meet. You know, our staff has grown, but we're still an organization of 50 people primarily at this point. So we really shifted to a kind of network strategy approach where we're helping other organizations and other people around the world learn how to teach solutions journalism. So we have, you know, we have fellows and train the trainers now in 20 different countries. We're working with other news organizations that are also doing training like the European Journalism Center, or since you're in Africa with uh, Nigeria Health Watch and Science Africa, in East and West Africa that are doing some of the trainings with networks of journalists across Africa. We also have a partnership in Canada 
with journalists for human rights. So really our, our approach now is to kind of like open source this and really just give away the IP to any organization that is in the business of training journalists or any individual, you know, individuals who want to set up their own platforms. We have toolkits online that are in 18 languages now, and those are still sort of like, you know, text-based learning. We want to get much more into online learning as we become more of an online learning organization. So, um, and we're also working with a lot of journalism schools, you know, you know, in terms of getting this into the curriculum for the next generation of journalists. Um, but our site has lots and lots of tools and resources. It's just a great place to begin. And then you can sort of, you can choose your own adventure through that. Yeah, I'm interested in, um, you know, one of the intimidating factors around even the word journalism is that for me, is that it is it feels like a, a bit of a, you know, kind of like an old boys club to me. It feels a little bit like an ivory tower. And, you know, it is the, it's the sensitivity I have around social media because it has been the place where people like me could have forum to tell the stories that are closest to us. And, and so I, I want to adopt the, um, uh, the power and label of journalist. Um, and I, I bet there are lots of kind of credentialed journalists watching this um, because I know that people are big fans of yours, David, and congratulations on a lifetime of work um, to make that happen. And then I bet there are people like me who are maybe intimidated to use that J word, but are storytellers. Um, and I wonder if you could um, distribute some of that IP to us today and tell us the top two or three things that would make us more like solutions journalists um, in our everyday lives. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, and, and you're 100% right, I mean, journalism, at least, you know, I can speak from a Canadian and American perspective, the two countries that I've spent my life living in. Um, it's been, it, it has been a kind of smoke-filled room kind of place. It's been very male, it's very white, historically, and, and it's very complacent about, you know, we get to call something a problem, we get to call something a solution. It's like the voice is very located in this kind of um, old, old power kind of, old power kind of club. So the thing that's happening around the world today that is completely destabilizing to journalism is that anybody can open up their own shop and start publishing and you know, get thousands or even millions of people paying attention to it very quickly. So we've, power is massively decentralized and it's happened incredibly quickly just in the last you know, five or 10 years. Um, and that's very destabilizing to, to, to journalism. The difference between like, a lot of that stuff is like people put all sorts of stuff out. It could be their opinion. It could be something they just heard that they're forwarding. It could be misinformation that we, we know that that problem. So, you know, when we talk about why journalism matters, we still want to be able to be getting some sort of a pulse of something that that is that is true and that is verified in some way. Now, obviously, you can't completely verify everything, but journalism does have standards for, you know, checking checking facts and so forth. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's voice that's very different. I mean, the way I see the world is very different from the way 100 other people will see the world and how we would sort of make sense of a situation. So, you know, I think one of the things that we hew to in, in, in sort of solutions journalism is, you know, when you're reporting on a response to a problem, you're saying, here's a problem. This high school, for example, is not graduating very many students, but five years later, it's now graduating 80% of the students. So the question is, first of all, how do you know that that happened? So what is some sort of evidence that says that that's not just a made up thing, but you can actually, you have some sort of sense of, of knowingness that it's true. And then the next question is the how question. How did it happen? That's the first thing that's really, that's more important than just saying great principle or you know they, they got the money or something, but really looking at what's the mechanism. And, and I find that we call these stories how done it's because if you come to problem solving like a detective, like you really want to understand like, like an Agatha Christie story or a Sherlock Holmes, you want us to understand how they actually did it. It gets you using the engineering part of your brain rather than the lawyer part of your brain. And the engineering part of your brain lives in curiosity and tries to understand things. The lawyer part is just defending your case that you already have. And I think that as journalism moves more into helping people um, think creatively about building a better world, getting people more in the engineer parts of their brain, we will have less polarization, we'll have less reflexive, just dismissing things that other people say. 
and actually surfacing more ideas that feed moral imagination, which I think is something that journalism could do a lot more of. Right. Can you talk to me about moral imagination? What do you mean by that? Well, you know, that, that the idea that consciousness precedes being, that in order to build a better world, we first have to be able to envision it and believe in its possibility. We need ideas. I remember when I wrote my first book about the Grameen Bank of Bangladesh, I went to Bangladesh, spent a year there, and I was kind of amazed that they had built a bank that could provide systematically small loans for self-employment to people living in Bangladesh in extremely poor circumstances, um, and that it was working systematically and the money was flowing and there wasn't a lot of robberies and you know, people were actually starting small businesses and improving your lives bit by bit. And, you know, for me, when I saw this, I was like, I would have never imagined that you could do this. Like, I didn't have that sense of possibility. Once I had that sense of possibility, that changes your sense of, it, it also gives you permission and excitement to invest your own talents into making the world a better place. If you don't believe that that's possible, just go out and, and focus on the rose bush in your own backyard and forget about the commons. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I, I understand that. And I um, I guess I understand that with like solution making, that kind of imagination, but it's the moral part of that question that I don't understand. Because I, I guess I feel like in my mind, there's a bit of a con conflict around kind of absolute truth and universal truth. And mm -hmm. so when you say moral imagination, that really does pique my interest because mm -hmm. I'm sure in Bangladesh, there are people who believed that that solution was somehow oppressive or somehow, you know, capitalistic or, you know, whatever it is. And so I wonder as a journalist, how do you, like in this world that is in deeply polarized and deeply immoral, how do you assert a kind of a moral imagination or a moral view without being, without taking sides? Yeah, well, I, I think actually you're not necessarily always asserting a moral view. You're, you're, I mean, this is more, you're, you're helping people see what does it look like when a school is more fair? What does it look like when a hospital is more compassionate? You know, what does it look like when a police department is not, is less racist or is more truly connected to the needs of the community and, and is not only, only sort of a, a force uh, is not only using force as its main method. You know, what does it look like when X, Y, Z, fill in the blank? Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of questions that journalism um, can answer and as it actually is answering through this model. And what happens is each time you see a piece of those puzzles, you see an example of, you know, participatory budgeting, you know, what it looks like when a, when a, when a, when a government at some level is actually budgeting in conversation with, the, the community itself. Well, once you have those ideas, it's like we don't like to evolve backwards as human beings. We like to continue to, this, this, this is working. It has values that perhaps um, you could argue about the, the efficacy of these things. You could also argue about the, the, the values that are inherent and built into these ideas. Um, but what it does is I think it gives, it expands your sense of both what's possible and what we should expect from our institutions. And that's what I'm sort of talking about, you know, raising the bar of expectations, um, you know, consistently. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a, when I was doing preparation for this, folks were talking about like asset framing, and I saw a lot of conversation on Twitter around that, and it kind of seems like what you're talking about here. Do you want to expound on that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the, 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 the creator of the framework of asset framing, Travian Shorters, um, founder of BME Community, he's also a board member of, of SJN, and I'm actually on the board of BME as well. We've been working very closely to integrate asset framing into journalism. The basic idea of asset framing is that we live inside of narratives, and it's very hard for people. People cannot choose to disregard the dominant narratives. It's done unconsciously. Um, most of the narratives we have that come from the news are narratives that are deficit framed. So there are whole communities in the United States and around the world, like, well, Bangladesh was one of them, but so is Brownsville, New York, that only ever get described in the news through the lens of what are their problems, what are their deficits, what are their challenges, and you rin rinse and repeat. And that creates a framework that causes people to disrespect those communities, to fear them, to stigmatize them systematically. Asset framing says before you look at 
any individual or any community's challenges, first look at their assets, first look at their aspirations. What do they think is most important to them? What is the capacity in the community? What is the agency there? You can look at a kid and say, this kid is a high school dropout, which journalists do all the time, or you can say, this young person aspires to graduate high school and go to college, but is facing a whole set of systemic uh, challenges and obstacles because of how we invest in schools and so forth. But if you know that this person, if you know their aspiration, that's much truer knowledge about the person than the card that they were dealt in life, right? That just tells you their circumstances. That doesn't tell you what's in there, what they really want. And once you begin with aspirations and asset framing, suddenly you, you don't mobilize against the person, you mobilize against the system that's thwarting the person's aspirations, which is a very, very fundamental difference. And journalism falls into the first trap way too often. Sorry, I keep, um, I make lots of noises when I'm listening. I go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's just, so I always put it on mute so that um, I don't distract or my picture doesn't pop up in the middle of your sentence. But yeah, um, I hear what you're saying and, I, and it sounds like a very um, healthy frame. I mean, I, you, you, wanna, you wanna have an asset frame. I guess I am, um, I guess I get frustrated by the field of, of journalism, David, because I feel like um, often, well, first of all, I feel like our world is moving in a fast pace, at a fast pace. And so whether or not your, your brain or your spirit can, up, can, can like process the Ferrari, it just is. And um, I think the, um, opportunity or the privilege to be able to sit back and process complexity and rigor often feels just like that, like a privilege. It, it just does um, sometimes. And, um, and I also think that this kind of notion of being, um, uh, I don't know the word, it's not unbiased, but you understand what I mean. Like um, where you, it's why I was curious when you said moral imagination, it excited me because I was like, yes, let's have some morality in this world. Um, because even the examples you gave, I have seen in journalism arguments on the other side, whether it's critical race theory, whether it's defunding the police, whether it's, it seems to me a very simple historic fact-based moral lines but I've seen journalism weaponized and used in the other in the other way, and so it makes me feel like you know, the true journalists who are being unbiased and just looking for solutions without morality. It feels like, man, that doesn't have enough teeth. <laughs> That's what it feels like to me. I mean, I would I would go so far as to say it's it's impossible to be unbiased. You're you, there's no view from nowhere. You're 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 always coming from somewhere. And you always are coming with a limited amount of information. If you're working in journalism, by definition, you're working quickly, <clears throat> which means you, you, know, you might have a couple of days in a newspaper, rarely much longer than that, you know, to report a story. So you're always dealing with limited information. And so you, know, you have to look at coverage over time, not any individual story to try to get a sense. But the biases are there, you know, understanding those biases and understanding that's why what's happening now in journalism, where these old legacy news organizations are not nearly as powerful as they used to be. And you have news organizations starting up around the world with um, that represent voice and agency of their communities and can actually bring in um, voices that can counter these dominant historic narratives and very, very damaging narratives, I would say, if when you look at like the history of coverage of race in America, there's a narrative of racial hierarchy that journalism co-authored for sure. And that is true. And you have newspapers across the country apologizing for it today, which is a really good step forward. But the narrative is still there. It, you know, every time you, you, you go to see the coverage of Kensington, Philadelphia, or as I said, Brownsville, New York, or some other community, you see that the narrative is still being reinforced. The bias is still being reinforced very strongly. And it's my, you said you were frustrated with journalism. That's what, why we created SJN in the first place because of a massive frustration. And there's, there's bias, but it's also, it, you know, it's, 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 it's gutting people's souls. I mean, it's, it's taking people who come into the world and, and you know, a lot of people, like I, I remember talking to Bill Drayton from Ashoka years ago, saying mm -hmm. people's greatest joy is being able to 
take what they love and can do well and contribute it to the world. That is your greatest joy. And mm -hmm. I think he's right. And I think that we have a new system today that absolutely undercuts that available pathway for people by making people think it's impossible, by making people think that nobody does this, that, that there's only a few crazy people who think that it's possible to improve systems or improve a whole society. Um, mm -hmm. So I think telling those stories from many different points of views so that you can hear, you know, you can hear, you know, and, and there's no one truth, but you can see the different pathways that are available for a person to connect their deep yearning to the world's deep needs. And that's, that's very available. That's Ashoka taught me that, you know, that was one of the biggest lessons. Um, and in some ways, solutions journalism is just a communication um, mode to try to, to amplify that, that signal. Got it. Uh, last call for questions of the audience. Um, we are finishing up here in about four minutes. The conversation's great. Thank you so much, David. And when you're talking about Bill Drayton, it, remi it reminds me of the last time I saw him, we we did something when I was in the fellowship, we did something like seven word stories or something like that. So you talking about brevity. And, and I used an Ella Baker quote, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. And so, and I am, I am, um, I am uh, really, I don't know, I'm curious about even, even our, the disparity between what a lot of time is and what rush is, because I was just like, not days, David, to write a story. I'm talking like minutes, hours. I'm talking about that on social media, there is a collective kind of zeitgeist of like interpretation on major stories that's happening like hour to hour. And it is deeply influential, whoever these kinds of influencers are, it's deeply influential on the, um, on the perspective of the world, on children, on, on policymakers, on all sorts of things. And so when I'm saying the world is moving fast, like it feels even still like a luxury to be able to sit back and write a story for two or three um, days. And I know that sounds crazy as a, for a journalist and I don't okay, think- let yeah. me, can I just, so I wrote a story about Girl Trek and um, is it fair to say that I got the essence of Girl Trek in the story or got, got close to the essence? It no, it was fascinating. It was, a it was the best story that has been written so far, except for all the other journalists that I love who wrote a story, but it is, it was awesome. Okay. It was fantastic. You, you talked to in depth with organizers in Mississippi. It was fantastic. And today on social media, there could be a smear campaign about Girl Trek, God forbid, that has just so much more impact um, yeah. than this beautiful story that you wrote. Well, and I just wonder I mean, how- That, we, that took yeah. time. I mean, you, you don't, that took that really, that took, I don't know, it might've been a month or something to bake that yeah. completely, it was a while. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, someone can just say something or just tweet something or just forward something that maybe someone spent an hour on or just was thumb sucking in their armchair and just wrote without any direct contact. That's the world we live in. We have to be able to distinguish between stuff that people really took the time to try to get right and stuff that people just kind of, you know, just kind of um, reacted to. And, and it's a, it's, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, I, I know that when I have gotten things right, I spent five years writing a book about the Grameen Bank and five years about Ashoka. It took a long time to really feel like, you know, like Bob Dylan says, I'll, I'll know my song well before I start singing. And I think that that's true. And I don't have the answer, except that everybody has to know that if you're getting something super, super quick on social media, it's mm -hmm. probably something that you should really check up on and not just take at face value, because that's just not how you get to truly understand things. Yeah, I appreciate that. It reminds me of probably what people thought about you all when you, when journalism like really took off. What what decade was that in America when journalism really took off? Probably novelists were looking at you all like, what well, is this? What like, is? This? <laughs> I mean, well, that's the thing that it was the penny press. It was the need to massively sell you know huge numbers of newspapers because of this model that became known as the penny press, the industrialized model of journalism. That's what led to what they called yellow journalism. That was the phrase that they used like a hundred years ago. And I forget what that comes from. It, it was, it was um, I don't think it was, I don't even know what it is. I hope it wasn't a racial reference or something, but that's what it was talked in the history books. And it was bad journalism. It was journalism that was trying to basically literally create wars so that they could sell new newspapers. And that was what Hearst and the Pulitzer empires were sort of built upon. Citizen Kane is a good 
uh, movie about that. Na that was when journalism really expanded. You know, today I think we're going back to the journalism that in some ways preceded it, which was much more hyper local and much more really actually connected to the needs of the communities that it was serving. If you go back to the, the colonial press in Eastern part of the United States, the, the front page were like ship landings and dentists offering their services. It was very practical stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, you know, in some ways, like you talked about journalism as a privilege, some of our, the journalists in our network will say that reporting only on problems is a privilege that our community <laughs> cannot handle. We need to understand um, what our options are because we're dealing every day with real problems that we not want to help solve. And we want to know what our options are. We want to know what we can learn from, who's doing better against this, where are, where are good ideas that could help us reduce the suffering and improve our communities. And so that's, I think problem focused journalism is in fact the deepest privilege. I couldn't agree more. I think, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think negative negativity, I think a lack of faith is a privilege. I think all sorts of things in that same vein feels very privilegy and suspect to me of people who have not struggled. Um, so I, I really do appreciate that perspective. Are there questions you have that are unanswered in your world that we could propose to the audience? And if people have answers or thoughts or ideas, they could tweet you or um, or reach out to you, David. Are you on Twitter? Yeah, you're at yeah, D at, at, at DN Bornstein. Yeah, DN Bornstein on Twitter. My yeah. 44 year old eyes. I've, it's like so funny. I can't see. I have to get so close to the computer. Um, and I'm yeah. at Morgan Trex. If people want to keep in contact um, with us, I am more on Instagram than Twitter. I am never on Twitter. Um, but if you so if you're interested in keeping in contact, what are questions that you're grappling with as you lead this massive movement? Let's end with those questions and let's not try to answer them here, but like Let's put them out into the world of Ashoka and to the uh, the dear folks who are, who are joining us today. Yeah, I think the main one for us is the one that you keep getting to, which is the fact that there is this, we keep, we're improving in terms of the number of journalists and the quality of journalists around the world reporting on solutions. It's really good knowledge. But then there's this thing called social media, which is really how more and more people are getting their information. There's this intermediary between the journalism and between the audience there are sense makers, amplifiers, you know, all the people out there who are who have feeds that reach thousands or maybe millions of people. We're trying to understand what that marriage is between what we think of as this really good, rigorous reporting on responses to social problems and people out there who have tremendous voice and platforms. How do we put that together so that more of what people are hearing builds their sense of efficacy, their ability to engage with the world, their sense of moral imagination, if you want to use that phrase, um, and is less this kind of reactive doom scrolling that, that can often happen on social media. Awesome. Awesome. I, my Ashoka brain wants to go into problem solving, but I will not hear. I will leave it open to the community. And thank you for joining us, everyone here. David, thank you for the conversation. Um, I look forward to you inspiring the world to be to frame assets and to imagine in moral and beautiful ways. So thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, and we'll talk to you all soon. Bye. Thank you, Ashoka. Thank you.